could see World Bank quite recently issued a uh, review as they do uh, every couple of months and uh, they talk about possibly a recession in large parts of the world, uh, at least a, a reduction of uh, estimated economic growth. Yeah. But they highlight that Indonesia uh, probably will not be impacted by that. And today, Indonesia is actually one of the strongest economies in the world. Yeah, and yeah, we're going to talk more about why Indonesia is so strong then. But um... you've reached the Seven Stones Indonesia podcast, where we talk with business people, entrepreneurs, and influencers in Bali and Jakarta about business in Indonesia. They share their visions and insights with us in conversations around why they do what they do which we hope will inspire you to believe you too can have a positive impact and make a difference. We hope you enjoy what they have to say. And if you do, please like, share and subscribe. Hello and welcome back to Seven Sons Indonesia podcast. Uh, my name is Julia Sanders and I'm here with Terje. Uh, we will be talking about the area we are in right now and talk about uh, Seven Stones uh, Indonesia investing here. Uh, let's jump into it. Thank you. I'm excited too and uh, good to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. I really like it. Um, so to um, make a start with the current situation, uh, what do you think about what's going on right now? With the world, I think I think it's a bit of a messy situation these days. Obviously, we've had two years with, with COVID um, and, you know, different types of restrictions all over the world. Some countries have been more relaxed. Some, on, some countries have been really uh, restricted. Yeah. And I think one of the impacts we see from that is that a lot of the European countries in the US uh, or developing countries obviously issued a lot of uh, different financial packages uh, which pushed a lot of money into the system. The stimulus checks and stuff. Stimulus checks and so on, yeah. And and, and now we're kind of seeing a massive impact of that with inflations and interest rates and so on going up. Um, In addition to that, logistics is still a a struggle because a lot of that stopped up, planes, ships and so on. And then obviously the ongoing conflict with, with Ukraine and Russia. So it's a bit yeah, of a true. Uh, the, the stimulus checks mm-hmm. is something that happened in the US, I think a lot of people know, uh, from the Federal Reserve. But it, it also happened in Indonesia? Uh, the government did issue uh, uh, also different stimulus here, uh, but not to a scale that we saw in the European countries yeah, okay. in the US. A much, much smaller scale. Uh, and I think, yeah, Indonesia traditionally is a strong economy. Mm-hmm. Dom- domestically, uh, it leans a lot into its strong agriculture and so on. So, so the necessity of packages in the same way as we saw back in Europe and the US probably hasn't been necessary either, except maybe for Bali, which is very important yeah. about tourism. Because um, it, the, the, it's a lot about agriculture here, like the, the impact of Corona, it's, it has been the same as in, for example, the Western world? No, I think Indonesia. We've seen that in crisis before too, financial crisis, you know, mm-hmm. acts of terror, whatever that has been going on. Uh, but traditionally, Indonesia leans into its agriculture. People lean back to their traditions, and that way uh, can go through uh, times like this in a much yeah. better way than, than the Western world. Yeah, and Bali, for example, is quite focused on tourism. Bali, so, yeah. Did yeah. it shift, or did it was it just a, a hard time? Uh, I think Indonesia in general, and maybe we we'll talk more about that later, has actually come through COVID in a possibly better way than, than before. Uh, That's interesting. Which is uh, different from most other parts in the world. Uh, but Bali, as a province who, who is you know eighty percent depending on tourism, is, is heavily impacted. Now we can see it starting to come back, but but for some time uh, it was really bad and sad to yeah. see how, how that impacted uh, families and you know livelihoods. People, people lost their jobs. Yeah. 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 It's a, it was a hard time for all of us. Um, and you're also, you have roots in Norway as well. Uh, have you seen a difference there with how people live there? Because it's quite a... I haven't been home actually since before COVID, but I think Norway is a bit of a unique situation. Mm-hmm. It's a small population, a very strong economy, uh, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. So I think Norway as an economy has... has been able to take this much better than other yeah. parts of Europe, yeah. A lot more financial stability behind all the banks and yeah. everything. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. And now we're seeing uh, a lot of inflation increases in the, in the United States with, uh, well, they're just printing money and there's no gold reserve anymore. Do you think it's going to be a problem in the future that they're printing this much money in uh, such a short time? I, I guess... Financially, there's always impact when more or less money comes into an economy. I think in many ways, the 
macroeconomy of the world was already having issues prior to COVID, and, and maybe COVID has speeded up some of those aspects. Mm-hmm. But I also do believe that that the world today and how connected it is, how interacted it is, it, it'll it'll find its way out of this. It might need some time, and it may have some some bumpy months and, and, and years ahead. Yeah, like we could see World Bank quite recently issued a uh, review as they do uh, every couple of months, and uh, they talk about possibly a recession in large parts of the world, uh, at least a, a reduction of uh, estimated economic growth. Yeah. But they highlight that Indonesia uh, probably will not be impacted by that. And today, Indonesia is actually one of the strongest economies in the world. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to talk more about why Indonesia is so strong then. But um, yeah, th- like the obviously the markets right now, they're all down. People are kind of scared. We're in a, like a, a place where, well, we've been... With the crypto market has been down a lot, the stock market has been down. Is it already the signs of a recession? Because we're not in the the three month of uh, down period yet. But. I I don't know personally. I, yeah. I I don't think it'll be a, a massive impact. There will be impacts, and 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 I think you know crypto for me too is something I do not understand much about and was mm-hmm. never any 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 engagement personally into it. And I I kind of always thought it would be a bit of a bit of a flop. Um, yeah. Eventually, it will find its way when it gets regulated and, and, and sort of uh, has a stronger, you know, re- not regulation, but but measured up against something. Um, country's economy, yeah, I think I think that Europe, US is 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 over leveraged and, and, and difficult yeah. for them to grow, and I think that leads to aspects like you know the, the sort of way that we measure economical growth and this aspect is something that needs to change for the better for the world. Uh, but that is also something that you see now that big investors and big funds in Europe and the US, they're looking this way to Asia because there's a much higher potential for growth in any shape or form uh, down, down this way. Actual production, actual things are yeah. being made, it's not... Yeah. Yeah. Natural resources. Yes high young populations and so on so it's yeah. all the all the right things from from an economical growth perspective yeah, yeah that's that's very true and um, there's obviously now a lot happening in indonesia also uh, mm-hmm. in the real estate market things are moving very fast especially after uh, corona uh, bali's getting more busy again yeah we we saw a very quick uh, jump back particularly from the domestic market uh, when the sort of travel restrictions started to to ease up uh, so I would guess that that is now probably back to 75, 80% of pre-COVID uh, uh, you know, figures. Mm-hmm. The foreign market has been estimated to recover somewhere between 2024 and 2026. Looking at the figures now in, in May and June, uh, probably it'll happen a lot quicker. There's still a lot of challenges with logistics, planes, you know, mm-hmm. planes that are being pulled back by the leasing companies and, and, and planes that needs to you know, go through a bit of a uh, engineering process to, to be able to fly again. Okay. So, so I think that that's going to be a challenge. But but we already see that figures jumps up every month now, uh, and more and more people come in. I think the different changes, if any, a lot of people kind of expected economy, uh, not economy, but tourism to to die out after COVID, and people would not travel. I, I've mm-hmm. always said that that's an illusion, and people will travel, and in particular. Western countries who now has a lot of money that they haven't been able to spend for a few years. Um, yeah. And then I think the the second thing you can see in, in, in Europe and the US, people kind of move away from the big cities. They look at you know, farming areas, smaller areas. Uh, and then you have what earlier has been known as digital nomads, but today is more like a remote worker concept. Where there's an awful lot of studies on where people would go and, and live if they can if they can be a remote worker and yeah. all of those studies, Bali is always on, on the top of the list and therefore I think we will see a a uh, massive number of people actually moving here to live here six months, one year, three years, maybe maybe forever. Yeah. And Bali is also seeing this growth in the in the people that come work as digital nomads, so they're not actually made a visa especially for uh, digital nomads. Yeah, that's an ongoing process and it, it was actually something that Indonesia uh, did come up with prior to COVID, but then mm-hmm. it was postponed because of the challenges through COVID. Uh, but I think in, in, in very near future they'll launch a what they call a digital nomad or remote worker visa, which means you can come here and stay here for up to five years without having to you know, pay any taxes as long as it's 
what you're doing as a business or work is, is, is based on a broad activity. So you have a business in the UK or the US or something has to like be that. Broad. Yeah. And you live here and, and spend your money. Once you start engaging with Indonesian clients, uh, then it's a different story. But I also think that the government should, should try to convince people to actually do set up uh, companies. So they should try to lower their uh, uh, sort of minimum investment that they expect from foreigners to come in here because the tax benefits of, of being in Indonesia as, as a foreigner or, or, or anyone uh, is, is really good. And once they discover that, I think a lot of people actually base their businesses out of here and, and, and yeah. contribute even beyond just, not just, but, but spending their earnings and money on, on, on living in Bali and other places. Because right now you can get a PM, PMAT, PTMA, PTMA, PTMA yeah, yeah. which is 10 billion, uh, 10 billion rupiah. Yeah. And it's around six hundred thousand yeah. dollars that you need to have before you can invest here, yeah. which is quite a big uh, step for people if they want to invest in the real estate market here. Um, but there are other options. You can get a PMA, I think. Um, uh, so if someone wants to start real estate here, for example, yeah. uh, is it possible to buy land themselves? Yeah, there's a few options. A, a PTPMA is, as you say, it has a quite a high platform uh, mm -hmm. in terms of minimum investments. Uh, there's different ways of, of going around that. So sometimes people join together in, in holding companies and, yeah. and therefore they can, can buy uh, less expensive units or, or, or less investments. Um, if you're coming in on a visa that probably will be launched at the same time as the digital nomad, which is called the second home visa, then you can mm -hmm. invest also into, into a villa or an apartment or, or whatever it is and, and then have Indonesia as a second home. Um, buying land as a private person and property, you can, but but obviously it will have some challenges in how you commercialize that. So I always recommend to any client to talk to some of the different agencies, including us, and, and, and figure out what the best way is to, to, to work with the system and yeah. still be able to, to you know, have a, an entity to hold your assets in so you have a clear legal standing in. Yeah, because the Indonesian government uh, doesn't make it too easy to uh, get in here with all the legal agreements that they have. I, I guess yes and no. I think Indonesia in the past has been known to, to be a bit uh, tricky and, and that's one of the reasons for why we've not seen a lot of changes in bureaucracy in particular. So mm -hmm. so there's something now called the omnibus law, which is a almost like a revolution for the bureaucracy and how much more easier it is today to set up a company and, and do investments in Indonesia because this law is specifically focused on building a company or uh, so the omnibus law when you look into it is more towards how it'll enhance and ease up on investments not necessarily just FDI but also TDI so domestic investments mm -hmm. um, and to encourage entrepreneurship because I think the Indonesian government realizes that the absorption of big factories and big companies coming in, it, it, it's not going to be enough. They need entrepreneurship, they need uh, a lot of activity among the Indonesian people too. So if you look at uh, what they call UMKM or small, medium and micro-sized companies, yeah. it's actually 60% of Indonesia's economy. It's and about focused on small businesses. Yeah. And the absorption of labor, 97% uh, comes from the same uh, UMKM or, or small, medium and so there's a companies. lot of small businesses who do hand labor themselves yes. and uh, they export mostly outside of uh, Bali? I think it's a lot of different things. It'll be anything from a food stall in the street to handicrafts to yeah. uh, other creative uh, aspects. People, let's say they have digital talents or IT talents and they can they can you know market themselves and do work for companies both in Indonesia and abroad. So it, it, it's, it's everything really. Yeah. Bit of export too, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because now, right now, there's just a lot of handcraft going on in Bali. Obviously, there's a lot of rare ores here. There's also um, a factory being built, I've heard, um, for the production of batteries. We're starting with this. Indonesia is, uh, since Jokowi went to Glasgow with, uh, with the... That's the uh, president? Yeah, the yeah. president of Indonesia. Um, and, and he talked about the shift that Indonesia wants to do with renewable energy. And obviously one of those is in, in, in cars and battery-driven cars. So they've now already opened up one factory and there's more coming that will produce uh, batteries. Mm -hmm. They've already opened up factories that do produce uh, battery-driven vehicles. Uh, and one of those factories, a state-owned company, wants to actually do a factory in Bali to produce electrical bikes 
Oh yeah, uh, for the Indonesian market and possibly export. Would be a great thing for the Balinese island, I think. Electric scooters. Well, I think it's good for for Bali and also Indonesia, and I think that it creates a balance possibly for Bali that doesn't only depend on tourism; it also yeah. has other other you know streams of income for yes. the government and labor and so on. Because there's now also uh, have been talks with Elon Musk coming here with the whole electric batteries and car situation. Uh, do you think that there's any future in Tesla here in Indonesia? Uh, I, the conversations between Tesla and Indonesia has been going on actually for a few years, mm-hmm. uh, and I think there were some challenges on on legalities and you know, tax benefits and so on that didn't didn't fit, but. This is also one of the differences from Jokowi, the president of Indonesia, and possibly other state leaders, is that he himself goes and sees this, not just Elon Musk, but any CEO in yeah. any of his international uh, you know, trips and so on. So actually, the president and Elon Musk himself had a conversation uh, about this, and prior to that, um, a team of a few ministers and investors had similar conversations. So I'm quite, quite sure that at some stage, uh, a few of the Tesla and Elon Musk's, uh, you know, huge business will refine its way into Indonesia. Uh, not just because Indonesia won it, but also because Indonesia is a huge international yeah. market, and big population and, and, and a big potential for Tesla and so There's obviously a lot of companies that would be interested mm-hmm. to go here. Do you think, um, because there's these companies, they bring in Western culture uh, a lot into the, into the Balinese or Indonesian culture is, I feel like this could become maybe a problem where how Western do we want to have a, a world like this where everybody has a, a way, a very different way of living? Yeah, I think anywhere in the world you, you have those challenges, maybe more so in Bali with a high level of tourism in addition to, to expats coming in for investments and so on. I think that's inevitable though. That, you know, yeah. it, it's a change that will happen regardless and the world is becoming smaller and smaller. People move easier and easier in between different areas. So than before. Uh, I guess the challenge with that is that the cultural change that will be expected and the cultural impact from a lot of foreigners coming in is is too fast. So it's difficult for the local population to absorb that. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think, you know, uh, different kinds of stakeholders, government, privates and so on can do a lot more to, to build the bridges in between you know, the foreign cultures and so on. And at the end of it, it's about understanding each other and understanding that we are different, we have different, not necessarily values, but perceptions on things, ways we want to do things, how we respect each other, I think yeah. it will be okay, but possibly yeah, some, some challenges. Yeah. yeah, this is also something I've noticed since I was in Bali here, where people are just so nice to each other, it's a, it's a whole different uh, community aspect that in the Western world we don't really see, actually. So yeah, like, I think... Um, I've been there a little bit longer than yeah. I've been there for 30 years. Uh, but same thing, I was very much attracted to the to the welcoming aspects of Indonesia. And it, almost anywhere in Indonesia, people are friendly and warm. Uh, family values, uh, cross-generation uh, relations, which I think mm-hmm. back in back in Europe we have lost. You know, uh, when we're kids, we're put into childcare and school and. and grandparents get put away into elder homes and so on. Yeah. We lose that engagement, interaction, uh, which I don't think is good. And I think also the community work in Indonesia is something they call Rotongroyang, which means work work together. Uh, mm-hmm. It's another thing that is still very strong and something we we have lost a bit, I think, in, in Europe. Yeah, people are here willing to help each other and uh, when someone is doing less good, mm-hmm. they're, they're ready to help them. And it also goes all the way around and in the Netherlands or in the Western world in general, it's a bit more individual, uh, everybody for mm-hmm. themselves, and especially with the family aspect of it, where people in, in, are going to daycares and people also that go into like uh, retirement homes, uh, they lose like the whole aspect of working and being with the family, and mm-hmm. they're getting a bit put away in uh, in isolation. Well, I think it's it, it's sad, uh, really it's sad very to see sad, how yeah. that happens and and how we forget about the contributions that our parents had to us and. Mm-hmm. We are having to our kids, and, and you know both ways on, on, on how that works and impact things. And I think we lose something as, as humans in that, that, that aspect. Yeah, yeah. I've also uh, read a lot about um, that people who um, <coughs> I feel do people here lose stop working at some point at some age, or do they keep working the whole life? Uh, I guess when you look at 
traditional villages to in an area where we are now, uh, people will keep on working as long yeah. as they're they're fit. And you could see this in other parts of, of Bali and Indonesia too. That as long as they're in their traditional uh, way of life, then they would keep on working until they're 70, 80, sometimes up in their nineties. Yeah. Uh, today, a lot of Indonesians retire, whether it's private or or uh, you know uh, government uh, work or government officials and civil servants. 55 seem to be a retirement <coughs> age, yeah. and it's a bit too early. And I think they get into a mindset of they haven't sort of been in a traditional way of life. Um, a lot of issues around food, health benefits or opportunities. So, so you see that the uh, morbidity, not morbidity rate, but the age of when people have health issues and, and, and need attention and, and possibly also seriously ill and, and, and passes away yeah. uh, it's, it's happening a lot with, with younger uh, people or not necessarily old people yeah. but having said that the government has recently launched uh, what they call BPJS which is a pension fund security fund and, and guarantees their entire population uh, the right and, and access to, to health care that's a nice nice change yeah. it's a western change a bit too maybe but the, I've I've, uh, I've read before as well that um, here and also on other islands, um, people keep working because they have their passion in their work. Mm -hmm. They they wake up with a happy mindset. And in the Netherlands, you see that people they work and they do something that they love, for example, till they're seventy six, and then it's normal that you quit working even though you love your job. So people quit their work and they get very bored. And I feel like once you are not waking up with the thing you like doing most, it's also when like diseases come more, you get more sick, you feel less good. Like this also, I feel like contributes to the fact that people get sick at, a, at that kind of age. Well, I think that's true. I, I think that people shouldn't shouldn't change their life dramatically. I, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's both ways that people do something they love and, and suddenly stop doing that. But there is also a lot of people who do things that they do not love and they're mm -hmm. forced into to a way of life, education, career that isn't necessarily their passion. Mm -hmm. And then when they get to retirement, they kind of are going to start reading books, travel a bit, and the change is that yeah. it's, it's a similar impact, I think. So. What do you think how people could um, get out of this life? Because I think there's a lot of people who are in the retrace of always working. They're um, in the Netherlands, for example, um, in the schools, we are building machines that can work for us, that like are in businesses. and. There is no outlook on life on how you can explore yourself. We don't know anything about meditation. What's in green school, for example, is something they do uh, contribute a lot to. How do can we? How can people like get out of this? Is there a way you think? I, I think again, humanity and and, and waves of, of different industrial revolution, technical revolutions, uh, political systems, mindsets of what is right and wrong and what we should do or not goes in kind of cycles and waves and, and currently I think we're we're into a bit of a valley if that makes sense where, yeah. where I think we've gone in a wrong direction for a long time. I think now there's more and more opportunities for people to, to do things that they want to do and that they're passionate about. What hold people holds people back I think is courage, courage to do it because we've Scared. been yeah. conditioned to think in a certain way that oh you should really focus on your education, get a job fit into the system. So I think for me, looking back at, at, at my life and what I've done so far, it was actually conscious. I, I get a lot of people saying, oh, you're so lucky you live in Bali. And I kind of go like, yeah, I guess that's true. But but that's been decisions. You know, yeah. you look back at it, you it's actually make choices. decisions yeah. and choices that will lead that way. Yeah. And there's obviously a lot of different ways on how you can find out that um, you're there's more to life than what you can choose. and. Um, Things that could bring you to this is like maybe meditation or like uh, reading books about uh, mindset and stuff. Um, what would you suggest for someone who's like kind of stuck in one pattern to to change? I think we constantly have conversations with that in our own in our own company, people around us, and so on. Uh, when it comes to mindsets, when it comes to be all you can be, and that there's different ways of doing that. Some people find comfort and, 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 and uplift in, like you said, meditation, different ways of, uh, you know, finding themselves and so on. Reading is one of them. We, we uh, like a lot, you know, the books of Simon Sinek, uh, mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, some of these uh, 
writers that, that puts a lot of you know, uh, effort into it and has very clear structures of how you can do that. I think a lot of people try, but they don't try long enough, they don't try hard enough, and eventually then the fear catches up with them again. And, yeah. uh, and they, they lose it and they go back into what... It's, what um, it's a risk where you have to step away from, which can be scary. And as with Seven Stones, for example, we are also focusing quite a bit on um, the why, why we do things and how we can help people also perhaps get in the same mindset when doing business. I think I think it's, it's it's inwards and outwards with that. I think inwards in the company, we we try to look for people who we can that has some it's the right word uh, vibe in them. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they're not aware of it, but you kind of get that through an interview process uh, uh, that they want to go all the way and they want to do something with their life. So maybe different from other companies, we actually want our staff or our team members to think that oh, I want to have my own office, I want to have my own business because that's human nature so mm -hmm. rather than trying to suppress that we try to encourage it and then we'll have two years six years ten years together with people and when they leave we'll still have you know some kind of relationship across companies and so yeah. um, and I think outward we we sort of say partners in growth and that we, we, we mean that we want to make an impact towards our clients and sort of realizing the potential the business how can we support them in set up legalities you know, the, the boring stuff like accounting, taxes mm -hmm. and so on, so they can focus more on their talents and what it is that they, they want to do and sort of hold their hand through that in a sometimes, uh, I wouldn't say scary, but, but a different market with, with different regulations and different cultures. Yeah, I think it's a, a great way how to help people. As an intern now at Seven Stones, I can also feel that there's a lot of uh, helping each other, there's no limits to uh, what I can do if I want to explore to something I'm I'm able to do that, which is really nice, and I think that's a, a great thing in business that we don't really see a lot in the real estate market here or in the Western world either. It's a lot about commission. I think I think in, in terms of interns, we we do that regularly, and I think that we uh, approach it a little bit differently mm -hmm. in, in the sense that we don't necessarily say, "Oh, this is your job; go and do that." In addition to that, whatever you have to do to 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 do your papers for the school, we kind of try to talk to people, what, what do you want to do? And sometimes people have a very clear vision on what they want to do, and if they don't, we try to sort of encourage that so they can have, in our view, a better experience and a better growth experience as, as, as a person, yeah. Yeah, I think this helps a lot of people here in the, in Indonesia doing internships, which is really nice. Um, if we go to um, another example, for example, in Indonesia, in Se with Seven Stones, there's a lot of real estate uh, companies here now currently. Um, a lot of competition from other people and Seven Stones is getting in here and it's doing a lot. It's, it has been growing. We have been having multiple offices now. Um, is there like a, is there a saturation point at some point where there's going to be too many too many realtors or I, th I think yeah I think I think already there is too many not necessarily in terms of agencies but uh, everyone in particular in Bali probably also in Jakarta is, is, is a broker uh, and the government should do more to enforce regulations because there is regulations and there's penalties for people if you're not a certified company or a certified real estate agent. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I think the market will find its way through that and people will then see quality or, yeah. or agencies or has some good uh, values to them. And, and in terms of companies, we sort of don't look at what it's legal work we do or advisory or, or real estate, we don't look at other companies as competition. We think that they have different values than us and there's a, there's a fit in between us where everyone can can find their market share. I think when I look at the market today, I think that very few of them are changing. Changing mm -hmm. in terms of technology, changing in terms of mindset, changing in terms of values. It's still a very much a uh, little bit of a wild west and we, we kind of call it commission breath agents. Yeah just think of how they can close rather than providing a good value to client and build a reputation that way. It's said that they're not changing really while the island is changing so much right now because we're making a whole shift uh, also with sustainability for example where um, well Bali has seen a lot of changes in uh, well in the market itself but also in um, for example I heard from uh, Andy that it's been a lot more gross before with all the all the plastics on the beaches and stuff um, how have you seen these changes in Bali being a, a plastic island? 
definitely that's, that's been a massive issue. Um, and I think, again, that's what we talked about a, a little bit earlier about the cultural understanding of what, what plastic do. Like in the past, it's been a lot of natural garbage. You know, the, the Balinese will use a lot of leaves and other natural products that mm-hmm. is easily, you know, uh, absorbed again by nature uh, and disappears. But, but with plastic and the amount of people, that has become a massive issue. Uh, but we do see now that there is uh, more and more local groups taking responsibility to, to, to do something with this. You know, you have uh, Songhai Watch by by Plastic, uh, who is uh, young and, and talented kids that, that sees that this is wrong and, and made a massive impact to drive it also politically. And now you see the central government driving that, and you also have a lot of interest and knowledge coming from other countries like I'm from mm-hmm. Norway there's a lot of technology there's a lot of movements to come into to bigger economies and bigger countries with huge plastic problems so there's a lot of ongoing activities and I think we're getting close to a tipping point where where these things will get out to the communities and the people and, and the pollution around plastic and other aspects is going to be reduced and what's already out there in, in nature and ocean will slowly slowly be dealt with and yeah, I think uh, the the companies always start like the initiative to uh, clean up the plastic, and it's really gonna change or change really when the government steps in and uh, tries to uh, clean as well. Is there already things that the government is doing right now to uh, to help with the plastic problem? The the Balinese province uh, passed the regulation several years back that mm-hmm. they were gonna end uh, single use plastic, so the shampoo sackets the plastic, glasses, water, and so mm-hmm. on. But then they kind of forgot about it. And now they're saying, and I think uh, one of the reasons for that is because the problem is so massive, uh, by end of this year, they're going to enforce it. And yeah. it's also related to G20 this year is in Indonesia. <coughs> that creates a situation where Indonesia is eager to show that they're doing the right things on, on, on anything around renewable, green, uh, you know, plastic, waste management, and so on. Could you explain what D20 is exactly? <coughs> G- G20 is, is just the 20 largest economies in the world coming mm-hmm. together every year uh, and they take turns on, on, on being the presidency of that organization. So they'll come in and, and talk about economical challenges like yeah. we talked about before, uh, human rights challenges around that, uh, pollution, mm-hmm. obviously uh, climate change and so on. So there's a lot of topics. And Indonesia took over from Italy November last year, and, mm-hmm. and there will be, there already is actually quite a few meetings happening in, in Bali, but the main events will be around October, November this year. And obviously now um, <coughs> Bali is using still fossil fuels to, um, to power the island, and are, are they on coal or gas, and do you know where they get this from? The Yeah, so Indonesia has a lot of coal resources, so it's obviously mm-hmm. been an, an easy fix until now, and a, a large percentage of their energy comes from coal. I think renewable energy or green energy is probably now slowly, slowly coming above 20%. Uh, but again, there's been a massive commitment to explore uh, alternative and renewable energies in particular, hydropower, you know, uh, solar panel, uh, wind farms, even nuclear. But I mm-hmm. think if they do think nuclear, they're probably more towards thorium, which mm-hmm. is a uh, fairly unknown way of nuclear power production, which is a lot less harmful than, than the traditional way of, of doing uh, nuclear. They're also not able to make uh, explosives uh, like nuclear weapons no. with... Uh, correct. It cannot be weaponized yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. But the problem with that is that now it's not economically viable because the um, obviously uranium wasn't also economically viable in the beginning of the years, but because there was a military incentive was a lot of investments in how to get this uh, going. I I think that changes now, and I see that if you look at uh, huge economies like India and China, it's really spending a lot of time, and we've had meetings here with with government officials too, and and, and groups that that look at exploring it. Uh, The knowledge today is is basically US and Norway uh, that has Mm -hmm. a high knowledge and experience with thorium, and and, and I see also from Norway there's more and more, a couple of companies already just launched research and actually want to, to put a time frame to when they're actually going to be able to have uh, feasible reactors running with thorium. Some of these are cruise liners who will actually have a, a thorium 
power station on a ship that oh, can wow. charge batteries on cruise ships. And so, and what is the timeline? Do you think has there been? I think we're looking seven? at realistically probably around ten years before ten it years. happens. Some some are saying two to four years. Uh, I don't think that's realistic, but, but mm. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Could be a positive change. Uh, to the whole energy crisis we're having. I, I guess the more energy, the more investments, the more focus that gets into it, the better, the better and quicker it'll get. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like once we, as a world, mm -hmm. uh, solve the problem about energy, because there is now uh, fossil fuels and we have electricity, energy, but once there is energy that we can have a, like a, almost an infinite source of energy in a safe way, this would solve so many problems where I think as a civilization we really can shift to something better with everybody. No, I agree, and I, I think that again the the, the change is happening, and it, it's changing quicker and quicker. Uh, I think somewhere there is a misfit in the sense that <clears throat> they've started decommissioning, you know, coal, uh, gas, uh, oil, whatever, before they've actually been ready to implement other technologies. So that's created a situation where, in some places, there is actually a shortage of energy. And, yeah, and that's what we see in particular Europe now is astronomical. Especially with the Russia, crisis. Russia crisis, where we now have to take, or we were taking um, gas from Russia, which was a became a problem because we don't want to take it from a, well, from a, what is it? It's a country that just chooses to invade other countries. Uh, so yeah, we have a pro a bit of a problem here now, but we're also all shifting to green energy, and hopefully thorium will is something that can also help Europe in that sense. I think it's been good for Norway though, because well, yeah. Europe now is looking for gas and energy from Norway. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's good for the Norwegian uh, economy. That's nice.